Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I am Dr. Mohammed Nazal, the coordinator of uh, Just CRS. Um, thank you so much for attending uh, our first webinar, uh, Occupational Therapy Task Oriented Rehabilitation uh, Post Stroke. Uh, this webinar is um, part uh, of the uh, CRS uh, project, which is uh, named and entitled Establishment of an Interdisciplinary Clinical Master Program in Rehabilitation Sciences at JUST. Uh, we are uh, so proud of uh, this uh, project and we are proud of our partners, Oxford Brookes University, ESSA from Portugal, and uh, University, uh, Jordan University, and the Hashemite University, and Hashtabi University in uh, Turkey. Um, I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Khadr Al-Mehdawi. Uh, he's an Associate Professor of Occupational Therapy, Department of Rehabilitation Sciences, Faculty of Applied Medical Sciences at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Just uh, University. Uh, I would uh, like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Khadr uh, to do his presentation. Okay, thank you, Muhammad. Uh, my name is uh, Khadr Al Mehdawi. I'm honored to have you all today in this workshop. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the task oriented approach uh, in stroke rehabilitation. Uh, part of the corona challenge, we are facing difficulties in. in uh, uh, in uh, online teaching. Hopefully, uh, I'll be able to uh, I'll be able to uh, send the most important clinical messages that I want today. That will uh, hopefully uh, yield in some uh, in some uh, clinical improvement in your in your uh, practice. So, without further uh, introductions. Every individual is as unique as his or her own fingerprint. So individuals are heterogeneous, different before injuries. Injuries makes them more heterogeneous, more different. It's unfair to provide the same treatment based on the diagnosis, regardless of the individual's factor. Treatment should be customized, meaningful, and functional. These are like, uh, like major points in our practice that we always uh, encourage therapists to do. However, we don't have like uh, fixed or uh, concrete guidelines to apply these um, uh, principles. So my objective today is to provide you with some quick revision of the stroke pathophysiology. I want to introduce uh, my little baby, the approach that I really love because it fits everything that we want in occupational therapy, the occupational therapy task oriented approach. Then, so every approach, I always teach my students to define the approach and state the, its assumptions and definitions and terminology. Then to go and do treatment according to this approach and then conduct intervention uh, based on this uh, approach. Then we, we all want to work according to evidence-based practice. So I'll show you some evidence of the task-oriented approach. Then I will show you, share with you some of my previous work, uh, research work and the case study. So uh, I'll stop between time and time for your questions. And uh, meanwhile, if anyone wants something, just write it on the chat or raise your hand if you want to discuss something. So we uh, cover the outline. So very important terms. When I say motor learning, there are two terms, motor learning and performance change. Performance change is not permanent. It's something that happens at the end of uh, the treatment session. That it's at the uh, that happens at the end of the treatment session. It's not permanent, not generalizable. So, to in order to have permanent changes in the life of the individual, the knowledge that you provided with should be retained or 
the client should have some retention over time and the appellate should be generalized. For example, if you taught your patient to cut something, he should be able to cut in the school, in the work, and cut uh, cupboard, uh, papers, uh, cloth, whatever. So the, the scale should be generalized and maintained for a while. Otherwise, you would not have changes in the life, uh, uh, real life situations. We have two types of practice, the blocked practice and the random practice. Actually, with patients with or clients with severe injuries, we start with blocked practice, meaning that we select the most important tasks and context and then make massive uh, massive practices over this. So it's the same task being practiced over and over. While Warando practice, you uh, vary your practice tools and setups. Life is random, so practice should be random. However, random practice only works with clients with good abilities. Feedback. There's no knowledge happens without feedback. If a student took an exam and you didn't give them their papers back, they will not learn. So error signal is important. Feedback can come from the patient himself, intrinsic feedback like uh, proprioception, kinesthesia, or external, like videos or the touch of the patient, or of the therapist. Critical control parameter, this is a unique term for the task-oriented approach. Meaning, what is the factor related to the individual, like strength, range of motion, environment, like the, how quiet is the environment, the, the lights, etc., or the task, how many words per minute I need to type. Critical control parameters are variables from the and belongs to the individual task or the environment that can enhance uh, the functional performance. Meaning, what are preventing my patient from being functional, independent, and having participants? I need to identify the problem in order to go for compensation or remediation. Degrees of freedom, the ability to have more smooth uh, variable practice, which means which means, uh, 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 for example, if I'm eating or writing, if I'm leaving all of my joints playing, that means more uh, work on my cortex. My cortex needs to coordinate my shoulders, elbow, and wrist. While if I did abduction, for example, I decrease the degrees of freedom. Now I'm controlling my forearm and wrist. So the degrees of freedom is to what extent the task can, be, can vary. We can increase the degrees of freedom to get better occupation and performance or decrease the degrees of freedom or the variability of the task to enable or enhance or make the occupation and performance easier. Now, I'll, I'll go quick on the following uh, section because it's very basic. I'll share the slides with you later on. However, Stroke is very important for adult physical dysfunctions. The, the common thing in stroke that all types or most types of stroke except rare ones like septic are related to vascular reasons. We have two types of stroke, ischemic and hemorrhagic. All of you know these terms. Ischemic is a closure in the vessel, while hemorrhagic is a rupture, bleeding. Now, most of stroke types are of ischemic type. Uh, thanks God for this, because hemorrhagic might increase in intracranial pressure and lead to brain herniation and death. However, so the 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 brain is so dependent. I'll get to that uh, on uh, oxygen. The brain cannot survive our central nervous system, including the brain and spinal cord, survive lack of oxygenated blood for more than three minutes. In three minutes, the crosses starts to Okay, and unfortunately, uh, we don't have documented neurogenesis, meaning dead neurons cannot be replaced like skin. Okay, so uh, after after stroke, uh, depending on the size, location, extent of the lesion, and location of the lesion, and the mechanism of the stroke will have symptoms related mainly most of the time to. Uh, sensory and motor loss. So these are uh, some uh, statistics. It's uh, in America, for example, 700 persons per, per, uh, per year suffer from stroke. Stroke is the first cause of disability in the world and the third uh, cause of death. Most of the individual uh, after stroke, two thirds of them need rehabilitation. Uh, 
survival rate is very good, 80% because uh, of medical improvements. Most of individuals regain their walking ability. So in my studies, I focus not because I'm OT, this is uh, like a silly, uh, 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 like a silly uh, discrepancy between OT and PT. OT works in the upper and lower extremity and PT do the same. However, because hands are more affected by stroke and hands more related to daily life activities, OTs tend to work more with hands. Anyways, so I decided to focus my, uh, but in my goals, as you will see, I covered upper and lower extremity. However, so about 30 to 66 percent of individuals are not post stroke are not able to use their hands most of stroke are ischemic and the uh, hemorrhagic is less now quickly we have two suppliers for the uh, for the brain look at this one this system is called uh, this system that is called the uh, internal carotid the internal carotid artery system this one and this one gives the anterior cerebral and the middle cerebral arteries. This system, the internal carotid, gives about 80% of blood, while 20% are provided by vertebral arteries. Look here, we have two vertebral arteries united to form basilar artery, and then the, basal, the most important part of basilar artery is the posterior cerebral artery, which is related to, to uh, Visual. Now, I'm not complicating your life, but at least you know you need to know the anterior circulation is related to lower extremity deficits. The middle uh, circulation is the biggest and associated with the hemiplegia as we know it, uh, affecting more, uh, more on the upper extremity. And uh, the posterior part is associated with balance, coordination, and vision. So as I said before, this, uh, this is the fact that I uh, went Anyways, quickly, why we see more deficits at the onset of stroke? Now, there's a very important rule for you. There's a term called uh, uh, neurological shock. Happens in uh, central nervous system damages, TBI, stroke, and, and spinal cord injuries. Whenever uh, CMS has an issue, what happens is uh, the, there is like a shutdown in the system, like, uh, safe mode if you want in the computer operating with with minimal with minimal uh, abilities so the take home message and the acute phase a few weeks after stroke the damage that you see and the patient perceive is much much more than the actual damage because of edema necrosis diachesis diachesis is having a neuron does not working because of edema or because of a synapse connecting it with a uh, a damaged uh, neuron. So a damaged neuron connected with a, an intact neuron will cause the intact neuron to stop, resulting in having a more deficit than the actual deficit. Okay, now in this period is critical. The patient or the client, the survivor of the stroke, tries to uh, operate his affected arm and fails, fails and fails. And the subconscious, this guy or this patient links the affected arm or the more affected arm with pain and failure and this suppresses his future attempts to use his arm and this is called learn and use they learn not to use their arm because it's connected with failure and pain however after one month their arm will improve this is a very important point to consider okay questions will be delayed for a while okay so remember these things cortex is the body ceo you know the CEO, the manager of a, uh, of a company. He knows the best, he has the best abilities, the best power, the best authority in the company. This is Cortex. Cortex is the ultimate controller of tone, sensation, motor abilities like strength, range of motion, coordination, emotions, everything is, is uh, I will take back emotions, is uh, hidden or controlled by Cortex. However, the, uh, Occupational therapy task oriented approach is heterarchical. Okay, the brain is the most important player in the team. It's, he's, it's like Messi. But there are 10 other players, the environment, the musculoskeletal system. So remember, whenever there's a damage in the cortex, the body has like a regression in sensory motor abilities, which meaning the lower centers like midbrain uh, or brainstem will take action 
like when we were immature kids, four years, three years, everything was compulsive and uh, incoordinated and bilateral. So cortical damage after stroke leads to regression to a less uh, status of motor ability. Anyways, quickly, and this might be the last thing about uh, stroke, we have the ischemic core and the penopra. Ischemic core is the focus or the focal area of the uh, stroke. Uh, it got like less than 24% of the blood supply, which led to total death. This is not uh, reversible. However, the areas around the penopra, this is the penopra, the good thing, and the areas around them had some color changes, but not like the intact one. But there's a hope. This is the hope of rehabilitation. We can train this to take, train this area to take the rules of this area, okay? By uh, uh, practice dependent neuroplasticity, like the same thing. How many times you played with the pain and scratch on the walls, practice and practice, practice, then you suddenly had the ability or the motor ability of uh, right. Anyways, quickly, I, do, I will not spend a lot of time here. Uh, major symptoms of stroke related to rehabilitation, hemoparesis or hemoplegia. Hemoparesis is less, just like motor or sensory, uh, loss of the contralateral side meaning if the right side affected uh, by stroke of the brain, your left arm and leg, depending on the artery, mainly if I'm talking about the middle cerebral artery, your arm and leg will have weakness. If it's hemiplegia, weakness and sensory loss. Spasticity is an increased resistance of uh, passive movement or exaggeration of stretch reflex, okay? So uh, it happens also after stroke. Now, after, immediately after stroke, the patient might go through milestones. I will not go there. It might have flaccidity and then uh, increase, slight increase of uh, tone, etc. cetera, till the, he or she can go out of synergy. Uh, go back to brainstorm stages if you are interested. Aphasia is the inability to, to produce or understand speech or communication. It can be global in both speech, uh, production and understanding, or broadcasts and, and uh, uh, workings um, related to one type of those. It's associated with right hemisphere damage or left hemiplegia. While visual spatial uh, deficits or neglect is associated with right hemiplegia or left hemisphere damage where the patient totally ignores the, the left side of the body in hygiene and using, etc. Other things might uh, happen in continence, less, less common, but very disabling. Uh, inability to control urine, for example. Memory deficits, agnosia, apraxia, but the main thing is the motor and sensory uh, deficits, like uh, lack of uh, strength, range of motion, etc. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, 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 the task-oriented approach, and at this stage, I think think I might, uh, okay. So the task-oriented approach uh, is an approach related to occupation therapy. First of all, we need to, to review some, um, some uh, concepts. I will let you a little bit, uh, give me some questions if you want. Okay, I think if I did this. Uh, okay, if someone wants to ask, just raise your hand. Anyone wants to ask? Okay, I cannot see anyone wants to ask. I don't know if Dr. Mizar is with me. I am trying to find the chat. I don't think there is any questions still now. There's chat? Yeah. Okay, very good. So in, in this case, I will get back to my uh, presentation. Okay, very important terms. A tractor is a variable related to the task. It could be related to the task itself or the environment or the individual, like strength or range of motion. This is uh, like a component of the functional performance. We talked about blocked practice and random practice. The continuous task does not have a start and end. Discrete task has a start and end. For example, discrete task like opening a, key, uh, uh, a door with a key. Serial task does not is a continuous task that does not stop. Control parameter degrees of freedom and motor dynamic. I already covered this. I don't know why it's redundant. Now I want to put you in the context of the task-oriented approach. 
The ICF is very important, International Classification of Functioning and Disability. It's a production of the World Health Organization. Uh, where the, the main thing that I want you to, to focus, both OT and BT are not uh, empowered yet in the world, in my opinion. So if you want to market yourself and make impact, you want to talk the international words and terminology. So whenever you put ICF in your communications, you will get more attention. However, I'm not going that, that way, but scientifically, the ICF has changed the view and the focus from the cause of the, uh, of the disability or the handicap to the result. So what is the effect of the stroke, CB, uh, road traffic accidents or activity? And so we are not focusing now anymore on the labels or diagnosis. We are focusing on the activity. And it hits something. There's a difference between independence when I'm able to eat and drink and walk in my own secure zone, home, versus when I eat and participate in the community. So the ICF hits on participation. So two points. We are not focusing now what happened. We are focusing what will happen on the activity. This is the ICF. And it includes environment and personal factors. It encourages you to customize the treatment. I will uh, refer you back to our uh, uh, loved uh, association, the American Occupational Therapy Association, and the OT doma uh, domains. I will not go basic now, but when we want to evaluate and treat, we want to consider the social culture, the environment, the uh, aspects for the individual, uh, the activity demand, the difficulty. These are basics for you. Whenever you want to evaluate a patient or treat a patient, think about the domain of the OT, where domains in simple words are the areas that we uh, apply our expertise in. Okay? So think about performance skills, performance patterns, what are the habits, the client factors, strength, uh, the mental aspects. Uh, the, psych the, the mental health, depression, anxiety, when you want to evaluate and treat. And the OT process is a dynamic thing, continuous thing, uh, includes collaboration and full partnership with your patient, considering it's his or her own environment and context and needs. There's no official start and end for the process. Every session is a treatment and assessment session because activities or occupations is our mean of evaluation, the golden mean of evaluation. And it's the golden mean of intervention or treatment and it's our end goal. Anyways, coming to the approach. How, so I promised you to define the approach and then give you the assessment uh, framework and the intervention framework for the approach. Now we will get to the serious business. So if I want, my definition, my own definition to the approach is a highly individualized, client-centered occupational therapy, functional based intervention. Okay, so these are the most attractive terms for, for us. Now, there's a marriage happened between these terms and, and uh, the, the neuroscience concepts like motor learning, motor control, and feedback. When we apply motor learning and motor control, these are neuroscience things and consumer things. With, with the individualization and client center thing, the yield or the product is the task-oriented approach. The training is intensive, va uh, intensive training. It's variable, you vary because life is varied in terms of the setup and you give intermittent and faded out feedback. These are the main features of the task-oriented approach. Now, the intensive practice comes from functional activities. So think about the self-care, the ideal, work and leisure, or productivity and leisure activities. You need to hit these three aspects. Okay, the OT domain are like uh, eight, uh, seven or eight, uh, learning and play and etc. But now focus on self-care, work and leisure, and try to generate evaluations and goals fitting or focusing on these, okay? Now the goal is to find the smart goals, and I get to that, hitting these areas, uh, and you need to, up, uh, to enable practice for the patient. Now the practice goal is to find optimal attractor. Okay, I did not I, uh, define attractor. I will, will, will 
we'll define it now because it's important. So maybe I got a mistake there, but I'm sorry about that. A tractor is like I write in a different way than Muhammad and I drive my car differently. I dress differently. So a tractor is the preferred but not obligatory button of doing an activity. So individuals are resistant for change. No one changes the way that he uh, comb his hair or uh, dress or eat if he wants to eat rice with hands versus with spoon or fork. You cannot change them. The change can eat, come from one thing, the need. If there's a difference between the need and the abilities, the patient will be able or willing to change. So you need to change the attractor. The patient will identify four or five goals related to self-care, work and leisure, because these are important, the goals are important and difficult. So difficult will have one of two problems, either in efficiency or effectiveness. So if I'm talking about eating, either I'm not effective, I'm not uh, uh, getting to my mouth with the spoon, or I'm spilling on myself. This is not effective. Or I'm getting there, but I spent a lot of energy and time. This is lack of efficiency. So if the attractor or the preferred button, preferred but not obligatory, I can change the button if I want, but usually we don't like to change. Anyways, so if I uh, spent a lot of effort and time, I'm not efficient. If I'm not at succeeding, this is lack of efficiency. So, what you do is to find the, the, uh, the problems in effic uh, efficiency and effectiveness by finding the control parameters. Now, say that I conducted the assessment and my patient uh, identified five goals. For example, uh, I, will, I will use the case study uh, uh, task analysis. So in my case study, we, uh, one of the goals is playing cards. So I took playing card and I did an activity analysis. Remember, I told you occupation is the most important evaluation treatment uh, mean or method and it's the end goal. Now, my patient cannot do something he will identify and it's important, will put it in his COPM. So I, I did activity analysis, meaning observation of activity or occupation, which was uh, playing cards, and then I found control parameters. In that patient, I found that he has spasticity, he has uh, he had uh, weakness, tremor, uh, he was not efficient. So I bought the things or the variables related to the individual or the task or the environment that I claim, what are the criminals? What are the things related to the task or the patient or the, uh, the environment that prevent my patient from being effective and efficient? This, after that, I will do my individualized uh, assessments, like I might do, might do, not necessarily, the strength, the range of motion. One, one, one uh, recommendation for you, don't conduct all assessment you want, just conduct assessment that you need, okay? There are uh, fixed assessment for the task-oriented approach and optional assessment. Optional assessment can be anything, a cognition for, for, for uh, mental health, anything, can be assessed under task-oriented if the task analysis said so. So, the, the approach is built upon motor learning and motor principles, uh, motor control uh, and motor learning principles, and a very important model in the literature called systems model. System models means that don't give the superiority or attention for one uh, uh, for one system. So for example, in a stroke, most individuals will go and uh, do NDTs and uh, focus on strength, etc. These are all, these are factors related to the sensory motor system. But don't forget cognition and psychosocial. Where these, all of these cognition and psychosocial are related to the person. Don't forget the environment, the physical, the cultural, the socio-economic. I, in my flowcharts, there are details, and in my thesis and publications, there are details how to evaluate these. Now, you need to assess the role performance and the occupational performance. So the point of the systems, it's a heterarchical configuration, meaning heterarchical in Arabic is la merkaziya. Hierarchical in Arabic is merkaziya. Hierarchical like NDT, everything is about the brain. The brain is the boss, controls everything. Hierarchical, the, the cortex is more important than brainstem, and etc. While heterarchical, everything is important, okay? So the assumptions, 
these are uh, like a dry uh, theoretical things, but as I say, heterarchical organization, everything is important, the environment, the task, the difficulty of the task, and the uh, individual system, like don't focus only on your own things in stroke. Focus on mental, motivation, stress, anxiety, uh, uh, everything, okay? Musculoskeletal also, we have complications. Uh, and then occupational performance task and uh, will be the interaction of personal environment. So if I tweak something in the environment, the performance will change. So don't waste your time only working on the own range of motion, motor control. There are a lot of things to change. And, and the functional task can help in motor behavior. Uh, every time you engage your patient with real life activities, the motor behavior will be improved. And the, the change or the behavior change in the attractor or the preferred way is like, a, it's like a, a reaction for a need. Whenever there's a lag between abilities and needs, the patient will change, okay? Now, uh, and more motor experience will help to find optimal solutions or optimal attractors or preferred uh, performance patterns, attractor, preferred uh, way of doing the things. So it's based on the neuroplasticity, our dependent experience, dependent neuroplasticity. The more you work, the more your networks in the brain uh, 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 get optimized. Now, the very important point, Recovery for, uh, after CNS damage varies. So it's not fair to give them the same treatment, meaning technique A from MDT might harm patient X, while the same technique might be helpful for patient A uh, or Z. Okay, so back to the task-oriented approach. So if you tried a... Uh, uh, a strategy or a technique, it might work with uh, the, uh, patient one, two, three, four, and, and harm patient five. So you need to continuously assess your patient. Now, remember these things, motor learning. So we are uh, motor skills teachers. Most of the time, we work on cognition and, and, and uh, mental health, but, but mostly when it's affect the function. So when I wanna teach you piano, for example, I will tell you that there's like it's a it's a funny thing. One time I was uh, training a patient in in the states, and he was a piano play uh, piano teacher, and you know in in, in my culture I like midwives and uh, whatever. I don't know nothing anything about piano, so I learned that there is a difference in the tone with the keys, uh, and I started to explore what is piano about. Then I told him. Okay, play me something complicated. Play me something moderate. Play me something easy. Then I started to grade his his uh, abilities. Anyways, when you are exposed to a new thing, you start to discover the components, the requirements, the indication, contraindic contraindications, and, and the complications, the risks. Uh, so you st start to read tech theory. Your performance in terms of motor will be when you start playing uh, is slow, clumsy and self-imposed rigidity will be like fixed and trying to focus on the activity. While when you, you uh, with practice and changing the types of the music that you play, the songs I mean, and uh, you will master the task. But however, you will be able to play one or two, three, five songs in a certain uh, piano. This is mastery in the same context. While when you are experienced player, like the guy I was uh, helping him, you can play either with uh, with with toys uh, piano, with kids piano. Even if you are driving, maybe maybe don't drive while you are playing uh, uh, piano. So you need to walk your patient through discovery, mastery, and generalization through intensive practice on your self care, leisure, and work activities. And you need to give a lot of feedback at this stage, a little feedback at this stage. Okay, and try to give no feedback at this stage so that the patient can do the activity in different contexts and, and uh, tools. So when you evaluate, this is me uh, in one of the good rehabilitation centers in the States. So like we have uh, a pre-requested our fixed or obligatory assessments in task-oriented approach. So you need to do four things. 
every time you get a patient, stroke patient, or any patient in, uh, with task-oriented approach, and pay, uh, pay attention here, uh, task-oriented approach works in everything almost, not only in stroke. It always uh, also works with kids and works with mental health, but, but it's, I applied it on stroke. So I want to write a note here. Um, so I want you, I will not write the note when I told you uh, about uh, the, the uh, learned and use. The, the dangerous thing in the learned and use is that the patient will not cooperate and will not use this, his hand or arm. The thing is, uh, since it's systems mod, uh, theory, the musculoskeletal system will be affected. If you didn't move your arm for a while, you will get contractures, stiffness, shortening, calcification, and they, you will have maladaptive neuroplastic changes, like the area responsible about your affected hand will get slower, less responsive, and smaller. Okay? So learn the news is bad because patients will not move their hands. The best treatment is to, uh, to engage the affected arm or hand in daily life activities. Learn and use should be broken because it leads to disuse, which means bad biomechanical consequences, weakness, shortening, etc., and bad neuroblastic changes. Anyways, back to the assessments. So the obligatory or the fixed assessments are rule performance. You want to know the rules of the patient. My recommendation is to use the rule checklist. Meaningful therapeutic activity to to have more activities as mean or therapeutic activities, interest checklist, okay? You know these um, uh, assessments, no need to explain them, but if you wanna Google them or find a resource, that's good. The third assessment is occupational performance task through COPM and then critical control parameter through task analysis. What are the criminals? What are preventing my patient from being independent and, part and having participants, participation? Uh, uh, that is effective and efficient. So what are the rules? Teacher is different than driver. Uh, parents are different than singles, uh, volunteers, etc. So you need to customize the treatment based on what this patient or, uh, does in his life. And then therapeutic activities, we have two types, the, go, uh, the goals and activities as mean. Our activities as end, which are the goals, and activities as the mean. Most of the time, about 70% of the treatment should be dedicated on goals, while 30% should be supportive activities to increase strength, range of motion, etc. I recommend to get these 30%, the therapeutic activities, from meaningful uh, interests or functional activities. I will get to that. And then, what are the function five top uh, um, areas that are important and difficult? And then, in these areas, what are causing the lack of uh, optimal occupational performance. So remember the domain when you want to assess and treat. And this is another uh, configuration. So we ask or assess for what are the life rules, what are the uh, tasks being challenged, and they are important. So this is rule checklist, air interest checklist, and COPM, Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. And then you select a task that you can analyze in the clinic. So for example, you cannot analyze bathing or showering. I, uh, you can analyze cutting a cucumber, for example, or uh, typing on the computer. Finding the uh, factors that are critical control parameter preventing from efficient, like good timing, time spent, and good energy levels, not a lot, and effective. Are the, are the uh, occupation performance successful or not? Task analysis, and then based on these three and the subjective information, we work by so subjective, objective, assessment, uh, and and plan. If I found a need to to assess cognition, I'll do. If I found a need to assess sensation, like cortical sensation, two point discrimination. By the way, in, in, in stroke, you focus on cortical sensation, two point discrimination, graphesthesia, etc more than the protective, like light touch and etc. It can be affected, but, but this is the point. Psychosocial, the, who is the caregiver? Uh, is there a supportive uh, link? Is this patient lives by his own? But remember to do standardized and non-standardized assessments. Like whenever you have a standardized assessment, it's better than non-standardized. 
Like FEM, for example, is a standardized. If I give you the score of FEM, you will understand the abilities of the patient as a therapist. This is the beauty, the beauty of standardized assessment. Now, don't forget that is the patient the environment? The environment is the culture environment. What is uh, haram or halal, forbidden or allowed? Uh, Socio-chemical, if I want to buy an electric wheelchair, does the patient have enough money? Is the patient living on a flat or uh, like 10th uh, uh, floor or, or having elevators or not? So these are the assessments. Now, look at this one, and I'm sorry because it's bulky. This is published in uh, Trombley, the seventh uh, textbook. I think it's chapter, my chapter, it's like six or eight, I don't know. But in Trombley, num uh, uh, edition number seven, and in my doctoral thesis, I will give you a link to it. So this uh, shows the OT process according to the task-oriented approach. You get a referral depending on the country, direct or to a, a physician. So when your patient comes, the interview skills is the most important thing for task-oriented approach, and it assumes that the patient's cooperative. You do the rule checklist for social participation, et cetera, and knowing what the patient's doing, interest checklist. Then you do the COPM. The COPM is consisted of three uh, sections, productivity, leisure, and um, self-care. So you go and ask questions about self-care. Can you eat, can you drink, ADLs and IADLs, and then find uh, the top areas. Ask him, what is the importance of this area from one to, uh, to 10? And, you, and then you do the same with leisure and self-care. You know the process. And then finally you find the most important, but the yet, yet the most difficult areas in leisure, self-care, and, and um, Productivity. My advice for my students usually, if you found two similar areas, like the patient is unable to cut food and the patient is unable to cut steak, cut food for cooking and cut steak for eating, I will skip one because they are similar. Okay? And if the patient identified unrealistic thing, you skip it or you negotiate with them, like C5 uh, uh, level, it's my court, NG1 walk. This is not realistic, for example, or not doable, not achievable. Anyways, for if in stroke, for example, if a patient with severe stroke, like a score under 24 in Fugelmeyer, wants to uh, do sewing uh, with the needle with his affected hand, this is not realistic. You, you want to negotiate. If one, someone wants to, uh, to, for example, play football and he cannot walk, you might negotiate having like Wii or, or PlayStation or watching, trying to change the activity. Anyways, when you find the top five areas that are difficult and extremely important, you select one and do the uh, task analysis. In task analysis, you focus on the person factors. Cognition, does the patient uh, seem that he or she following your orders, are oriented, etc. If you found a problem, you might do individualized assessment, for example, MOCA, etc. Psychosocial, sensory motor, all of these, you can refer back to them either in Trombley or my thesis, grip strength. These are not obligatory. These are optional based on the outcomes of the task analysis. The same thing about the task, you want to know the performance level, how many words per, per, uh, per minute I need to type, how many sandwiches in my restaurant I want to do in, uh, in, in an hour. So the same task level varies between, like a secretary might want to type 20 minute, uh, words a minute, while a retired individual wants to chat with his uh, 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 kids, uh, might need to type like 10 words per, per uh, minute, okay? So the level of the task, etc. And the environment, where you are doing the task, the physical context, etc. Now, these are very important in assessment. Um, I mean, the person, task, and environment. In order to customize the treatment and in order to go uh, through compensation or remediation. So usually compensation makes the, uh, the activity harder to get better performance. And remediation, compensation uh, might make it... Uh, easier and remit it so that you, you enable successful performance. While remediation make it harder to get better performance. For example, if I'm working on typing, I might uh, compromise uh, the patient. I will say that I'm gonna 
ask you to do 20 uh, words per minute instead of your uh, of 30, for example. Anyways, I will get back to treatment in more details about compensation or remediation, but the important thing is to keep everything in the natural environment of the patient. For example, if the patient wants to shower, the thing that you need to ask, it, usually before a stroke, how many minutes you spend in the shower, uh, or within how many minutes you end your shower. So if it's the norm of that patient is 10 minutes, that means he uh, the goal should be 10 minutes. For example, I have my little brother, when we were kids, uh, shower habits wa uh, was, our habit was, he showers till the hot water ends, period. So he will be staying in the shower till the hot water is end. So don't force your patient uh, to adopt a goal. Keep the context and the uh, timing and the conditions, the criteria natural. Ask the patient, what were, were you doing before? Anyways, and when you add the five control parameters, what are the things that prevent my patient? And then you judge. Is there a lag between abilities and needs? Meaning, is there anything inefficient? Meaning the patient is spending too much time or effort or ineffective failure. Then if the patient is motivated and he has problem in effectiveness or efficiency, the patient is eligible with the task-oriented approach. If the patient is okay, everything is okay with them, functional-wise, you kick him out from the treatment because he does not need anything. You know? So the thing is, uh, the patient needs to be motivated and has efficiency or effectiveness problem. But the other thing you need to, uh, to assess is, uh, when you do task analysis, uh, watch the attractor. The attractor is the performance button, the button that the patient prefer. Try to, uh, to interrupt that button. If the patient accept change, this means the button is in transition and the patient might accept change. If it's too fixed and the patient's protective about it, it's in, not in transition, it's fixed. So if a, you have a fixed button and the patient is resistive, you are advised to go to compensation compensatory techniques. If the pattern is not fixed and the patient accept change, means that the attractor in, in transition, you can go to remediation. Okay, I'll stop here and I'll see if uh, someone wants to ask. Uh, do you want to write your questions or raise your hand? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, Yusuf uh, asks, uh, so what is self-imposed rigidity? Uh, it's the same thing as rigidity. I will uh, define the difference between rigidity and uh, spasticity. So depending on the area affected in the brain, we might have uh, rigidity. Uh, I want to stop here. I want to uh, send my greeting to my PhD colleague, uh, Dr. Jeff from the States. I know that you cannot talk, but I'm happy that you are here. Anyways, so rigidity is in uh, it's resistance or difficulty to move the uh, say the elbow in flexion and extension. It's like cook wheel uh, phenomena. Okay, so both sides has resistance and regards of the velocity of the passive movement. So these are resistance for passive movement. In spasticity, it's only kicks when the movement is quick. So it's velocity dependent and it's unidirectional. If I have biceps spasticity, I cannot open my hand to the, to the extension. While rigidity, it will uh, be difficult in both ways. Okay, I'll stop here for this. Any question other than that? Okay. What, is, what is the difference between activity as a role and activity as a mean? Okay, so I'll get to that in, in, in the treatment. Uh, so we, we have two things in the occupational therapy. Uh, practice activities as mean and activities as end as end is the outcome right should be related to the goal for example uh, eating um, not eating uh, like uh, drawing drawing might be a hobby for me and i didn't identify it as treatment goal but i like it i enjoy it this is like interest can be converted to treatment activity or activity as mean like you can increase the reaching ability while uh, drawing overhead. So when it's activity as mean, you can act whatever you want with it. You can add weights as the patient drawing to increase strength. You can change the 
tactics, the types of the colors as you want, because it's the goal here is not the performance, it's the therapeutic outcomes like decreasing spasticity, increasing reach. While in another patient, a, a, a painter or a, an artist might have painting as a goal. Now you want to be careful. It's activity as end, which our goal, you need to do the training, focusing on occupational performance, the, the accuracy, the outcome. You cannot change, you cannot put weights, you cannot change the height. Now you need to conduct the treatment in the natural setup like what he or she is doing every, in every day. Okay, any other question? Okay, the last question is, um, can you explain uh, very shortly uh, the classification of ICF and how it relates to task-oriented approach? Again. Okay, so it's, it's out of my topic, but I brought it to, go, to put the task-oriented approach in its context. Now the word uh, was like in the, uh, in the 20s and etc. Patients and especially mental health patients were kept in institutions. And late in the 60s, there was the institutionalization movement, meaning that we want to do community integration with these patients. But at that time, uh, like the revolution of de institutionalization, meaning community integration, people started to label a, pa a patient with their uh, diseases. For example, stroke patient, CB patient. Uh, the ICF is a product of the uh, health, uh, World Health Organization under the United Nations uh, asked us to stop labeling patients like individual with a stroke, individual with CB, okay? Stop labeling patients with their uh, diseases. Then don't focus on the origin or the mechanism of the disease. Focus on the effect on the daily life activities in the, at two levels, independence, in your home and participation with the community. So I brought the ICF and it's talking about body function and body structure and activity. I, I mentioned it to make our efforts global as OTs and to have more ears as OTs. So to be consistent with the, uh, the, the international uh, health movements, okay? So the point is the world is going toward client-centered, like give the options for the client, respect the client, and ICF, focus on the effect. So that is consistent with task-oriented approach. Okay, uh, last question, uh, and then we'll go for the, uh, answer the other questions in the practical case. Uh, can you explain, please, the control parameters? Okay, so, uh, the focus of the task-oriented approach is on the individual systems. When I say individual systems, the neuro system, for example, which is motor control, spasticity, tone, uh, uh, active initiation of movement, musculoskeletal like strength, emotions, stress, everything related to the person, okay? This is the f first system, person. The environment, if I'm working, like for, for example, at this moment, I put a robe on my uh, daughter's hands to enable an optimal environment to deliver this. I had to explain why I'm uh, putting a tie for my daughter, okay? So I'm trying to optimize the environment for my uh, work, okay? So there's factors from the environment. The third thing, factors from the task. For example, if I'm lecturing for undergrads, no offense, the level would be much easier. If I'm lecturing for a therapist, I will go a certain level. If I'm lecturing for professors, uh, the research focus. So the task itself, the individual uh, systems, the task in terms of difficulty, everything from the task, the individual and the environment has sub factors. These factors can enhance the performance. For example, I love, task-oriented approach, I'm motivated. This is a subsystem or parameter that uh, enhancing my performance, hopefully. But if I don't like the lecture and etc., the demotivation in my subsystems is a critical control parameter. You need to work on my motivation in order to improve my performance. The same thing, if you found in task analysis, when you observe the task, that there is trimmer, but you need to work on trimmer to improve the uh, performance. You might find specificity. The thing is, you will not find the same thing across all patients. The thing that I can say uh, that I'm confident about across all patients, all patients of stroke will have sensory and motor or motor 
if they are hemiparesis, they might have sensory. So motor and sensory deficit, mainly in strength, range of motion, okay? So all, any stroke patient needs strengthening. Any, even, even if someone told you he has spasticity, don't strengthen. Spasticity is not equal to strength. You need to remove spasticity and then strengthen. So the long story short, you need to find the, the, the criminals, the things that you blame about the lack of efficiency or effectiveness of the occupational performance. These factors should, can be related to the task environment or the individual. Okay. More questions? Uh, uh, there is a uh, question I, 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 from Hassan. Okay. Where's the question? Uh, does this technique uh, work with a chronic case, mainly if patients learn from yeah. the case that I'll present for you, if you allow me, uh, is a 12 years uh, case, super chronic. Okay. More questions? Not. Uh... Okay, I'll, I'll get back to my presentation. Okay. Okay. You go ahead. I'm going. Okay, so we ended the assessment. Now we will want to write goals. If all of you are, are experts in writing goals, the goal should be specific. Eating is not specific, while eating uh, rice with a spoon is specific. Measurable, eating rice with a spoon is not measurable. Eating 10, ten consecutive uh, scoops of rice is measurable. Attainable uh, or realistic. Uh, when, when someone, I, I gave you an example about that C-wing for a severe patient who cannot open and, and uh, close his fist or hand is not attainable, okay? So you need to go compensation or realistic. Relevant, um, for example, uh, uh, hip hop dancing for a 70 years old male in our culture is not relevant. He might be, uh, be pissed off and, and uh, he might hit you with his crutch, okay? Or for example, dressing, uh, dress designs, for example, is more, I'm not anti-feminist here, but it's more relevant to girls, okay? Uh, time bound, you need to do two time frames. Like, a patient will be able to button his shirt within one minute. So you need the little time frame for the task itself within one minute, and the big time frame after six weeks of treatment. So you are expert in this. The goal should be smart. Now, this is the task-oriented piece. Level of OTT, uh, all goals should be A, B, or C. This is uh, demonstrated in the, in the chart. So level A is totally reversing the effects of a stroke. Subhanallah, nothing compares with God's uh, abilities. So we cannot, if you broke uh, a vase, and started to glue it, you will not return it back to its original status, okay? But I'm talking about level of performance. So you ask the patient, what was your level of ability barrier to stroke? I was able to end my shower because of the uh, problems within 10 minutes. So the end goal should be, the patient will be able to independently shower within, within because dexterity. I might use within or for. If it's about pain and endurance, I will use the word for. Like the patient will be, if he is at the pain, the patient will be able to walk for 10 minutes. If it's challenge about dexterity and control, I will say, I will give a deadline with them. Anyways, so the, my end goal, the patient will be able to shower within 10 minutes while standing in the shower and independently. Okay, this is reversing the effects of the stroke. This is level A uh, or elite or premium uh, level of goals. Level B, okay, my patient is moderate uh, and he cannot, cannot do it in, uh, in 10 minutes. I might go, say like 15 minutes without any assistive devices or 20 minutes. Or I might say using a chair, etc. Or I might say elongated handle, uh, spoon or whatever. So there's a, comp a compensation or compromise. Or maybe the rule of my right hand will be less than usual and the left hand will do the most. So here is totally like the prayer to stroke. Here, like I do a little compensation or, or uh, compromise. And level C, 
I will do, will depend totally on the non-affected hand or will on assisted devices, okay? So remember, what is your aim? You want to do long, share, uh, short, uh, term goal, uh, long term goal and short term goals. No, a short term goal should be like stairs leading to long term goals. Have you ever seen a stair like this? And then goes to it like this. So steps should be consistent, okay? You know how to grade up and grade down activities. So we'll go to intervention. Now, uh, this is an interesting thing. This is the mobile arm support. I used it uh, for the purpose of uh, remediation. I wanted to train the patient on grass release, but the problem is I don't want him to focus on his elbow and his shoulder. So I put him in this device, which gives some anti-gravity assistant. So he is worried about his grasp release. Why I needed this? Because usually we need to reach in order to grasp and do manipulation. How to reach without, uh, without the burden of the other joints? Now this is called decrease degrees of freedom. I omitted or eliminated the burden of these joints in order to improve this. And I couldn't improve this, the rest, without involving the other things, okay? This is my task analysis. The patient uh, was a family-oriented guy, and he wants to play cards. Uh, look at his um, poor uh, performance here. So this is uh, activity as mean, uh, as end. This is one of the goals. I chose to, to do uh, uh, the task analysis, and I designed treatment for, for it. This is activity as mean. There is no anything in the patient goals or real life like this. Tamam? There is no goals to, uh, to hold uh, golf balls in this context. But I want to work, focus on, um, on grass release. So these activity as mean or wasail ilajiyya, 30% of the time, not more. And these 70%, okay, of the time. Now, the, uh, the, the activities as mean could be stretching, spacity management, could be MDT, PNF, anything. So you can borrow any approach under the task oriented approach. Uh, okay. The thing is, the, the treatment characteristics and it's listed. I'll try to, be, to give like uh, a clinical tips for you. You need to uh, partnership with your patient. What are his, his, uh, are his needs, preference? Give him authority. For example, it happened with me, like we started to work on four goals and the patient said, okay, okay, I don't want to work anymore on this. You need to stop, it's his life, his treatment. You wanna share uh, ideas and uh, discuss with your uh, patient. You might get amazing ideas, like the uh, piano example. For example, I don't know what is uh, called in English, but you know, the painting with this uh, with uh, with the uh, needle and a thread the trees in arabic i know nothing about it okay uh, but but i learned from my patient okay because it's important for her it was important cooking is apparently one of my favorite things i didn't have any problem with teaching cooking for patients <laughs> anyways so partnership get ideas from your patient for treatment intensive training now I will take some things or things that we are taking for granted. For example, how many times your kid uh, uh, scratch on, on, on walls and uh, destroyed things for you before uh, having pre-writing skills and writing? He or she or we do millions of uh, repetitions across our life to get the motor level or motor performance level. Do you expect in two or three, four, five sessions to, to, to establish a new motor behavior or attractor. So don't waste your time with the patient saying, okay, did you watch the game? What are you doing then? And don't scratch your head thinking about activities, what to do. You need to know everything before the patient comes. All the activities need to be prepared ahead, okay? And you don't, wanna, you don't want to lose any single second. You need to intensify your treatment in the clinic and you need to create Treatment as home-based exercises. Ask the patient, okay, take a cucumber and cut it every day. Uh, button and, and button your shirt three times a day. If you didn't train at home and at the clinic, you will not make changes. Natural environment. If your patient wants to do a goal related to uh, carpentry, for example, ask him to bring his saw, his screwdriver, uh, his knife if he's cooking, okay? At one time, I asked my uh, patient to bring his gun. Uh, rifle or something 
okay? But I told them, please, don't, don't bring uh, pellets with it, okay? So natural environment, if you want to train on uh, eating or a breakfast, ask the patient to come in the morning, okay? Lunch at the evening. Ask them to do the activity with normal tools. Now, remember this statement. Simplicity is the ultimate complexity. The way that iPhone is dominating the world, or was dominating the world, because it's a lot of technology in a simple interface. It's simple to use. So whenever the world between the clinic and the real life is thin, and there's no difference between life and treatment, this is a good sign of good treatment. Because neuroscience, kinesiology, uh, movement analysis, everything, all the evidence says, if it's meaningful and salience, uh, the performance, like the displacement and the torque and the neuroplasticity, everything, the activation patterns in the brain, everything is optimized. And the neuroplasticity is maximum, okay? So whenever you do meaningful activity in natural environment, natural tools, you will get more permanent changes, permanent changes, motor learning. I'm not looking for performance changes. If I'm training on uh, hitting a ball, uh, basketball, at the end of 30 minutes, I will be improved in scoring. But the challenge, after three days, when I get back, is the change, uh, the change permanent? Can I uh, do the scoring in a game, different context? This is motor learning. Now, function, uh, functional practice is so important outside of the clinic. Now, task-oriented terms. The levels of treatments are three. A, the functional activities identified in Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. The patient goals, three, four, five different goals, realistic, smart, etc. You need to spend 70% of the time directly on the performance of these goals. Don't try to fix all of the problem of the patient. Try to focus on three, four goals, cover leisure, self-care, and, and uh, productivity. This is level A, the elite level. Level B is, uh, it's called level A goals or activity as end. Now, level B is activity as mean. But the ones that has value for the patient, like interest, the patient like handwriting, the patient like painting, but painting and handwriting are not goals. So they are a perfect activity as mean or level B. Now level C, and you, you might be surprised, anything that is not directly transferable to your life activities or does not have a meaningful uh, value, like arcs, cons, grammanizer, whatever, anything that does not have specific real value, therapeutic activities, extension boards, whatever. How often does a patient do cons? But the same training could be do, done by having uh, cups on the cabinet of the kitchen or box at the shelf, top shelf, okay? So try to use real life activity. Try to eliminate the difference between the real life of the patient and your treatment activities. So you need to vary the context, changing the tools and the setup, uh, eating on the dining table, eating on uh, uh, ground like the Arabic way, uh, 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 eating in the mall, eating, etc. The tools, heavy, uh, uh, large, etc. Practice schedule, like in first session, do activity A, B, C, and D, and then do E, F, and like mix between the order of the activities and the tools. Intensify your um, training and feedback. I will talk about feedback. Feedback is the error signal. Like uh, it should be intrinsic, like the patient needs to depend on kinesthesia proprioception. But uh, if not, you give him uh, feedback about results, like stay till the end of the activity and then tell him that you did this and that and that. More than feedback of performance, like during that. The, the thing is, feedback of result at the end is better than feedback during the activity. But if the patient is uh, having difficulties or severe stroke, you need to give them a, a, a big amount of feedback, continuous feedback, okay? Then as he or she improves, you need to take the feedback out. Feedback can be uh, 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 therapist touch or guidance, verbal, it could be anything, okay? Functional based should be real life activity like walking 
10 uh, steps is not functional while walking uh, while shopping or walking in a garden with a friend is functional goal client centered when you use uh, copm it's automatically client centered and consider the individual and the task is he living in, in, in the desert versus in the city now this is the, the protocol and it's published in my thesis spend 70 percent on the client's goals activities as end and spend the rest on any other supported treatment activities could be uh, entity uh, weight bearing or movement over body part or whatever or, or uh, uh, bearing icing from uh, uh, bnf for spasticity etc cimt any technique you can borrow uh, or just functional uh, practice okay uh, so this is level a spent 70 percent on level a and 30 percent on level b and c the least thing is to use is the arc the cons, the things that are not directly uh, related to the real life activities. And then my protocol or my recommendation was two sessions uh, per week, each session one and a half hour. I prefer not to exhaust my patients with, with transportation. Uh, and try to create one hour of home work activities. Try to, in, to, to change the life into treatment. For example, there's an uh, assessment tool called MAL, Water Activity Log. Write it down, motor activity log. The motor activity log is, is an assessment, um, but I'm not using it for assessing now. Uh, the mall has 30 co very common daily life activities, like uh, eating a sandwich, opening a drawer, uh, opening closet, opening curtain. So very common, very common, and we don't pay attention, opening the light, opening the, the water tap. Utilize these 30. Uh, opening the refrigerator, like in, we are now in, in a quarter time, I opened the free, uh, refrigerator twice a, an hour, okay? So, ask the patient as the caregiver, whenever the patient wants to, uh, to open the refrigerator or open uh, the lights, turn on the lights, etc. The task, the mal tasks, the task from the mal, ask him to do it in his affected hand. Each time, create one or two assignments. Like I tell my patient, go and use your affected hand with the refrigerator and when you're putting the blanket. Next session, I start by asking him while I'm putting him uh, weight bearing and stretching. Did you open the, uh, the refrigerator? Did you uh, pull the uh, blanket? I ask him and ask the uh, caregiver. Now the thing is, you need to write it down, the home-based exercises, otherwise, it will not uh, be conducted. Not documented, not done. It's like our students, if I told them, go and uh, read in Trombley. Good luck in that. But if I told them, go and read from page 50 to page 70. Mm -hmm. If I told them, go and, and I will examine you or I need an assignment, everyone will do it. So if you didn't write the exercises for your patient, uh, you will not be able to increase the intensity and the tasks. And if you didn't have records for yourself, you will not be able to grade up the activities. Now, start with remediation. To give the, your patient better chance or better ability, uh, start, now we have remediation and compensation. Remediation is trying to reverse the effects of a stroke, like uh, strengthening, increasing uh, motor control, decreasing spasticity, increasing range of motion, increasing, uh, improving grip patterns, okay? These are all uh, things that we are trying to repair. Remediation is repairing, while compensation is tricks. So I always start with remediation. Whenever I do a task analysis and the patient has the uh, ability to do 40, 50% of the attack, task correctly, I will start going with remediation. But if the patient has severe spasticity, severe learn and use, poor abilities, and they tried and they tried and they didn't uh, succeed, I will switch to compensation. Compensation is hierarchy. You start with finding a new way of doing the activity. For example, ask your patient to dress while sitting. So this is a little bit, it's like spices or, or uh, chili. You increase it gradually. So the, the least flavor is changing the way of doing the activity, dressing in uh, while sitting. Now, if the patient uh, didn't succeed in improving effectiveness and efficiency, go ahead and try to adapt the current tools. Like, okay, don't use uh, very tight clothes. Don't use small buttons. They use zipper instead of button. Okay, so I'm changing within the norms. 
then you increase the, the flavor. Uh, you, you adapt what he owns, like I'm enlarging the pen. I'm uh, uh, putting a, a, a circle or a, an attachment on the zipper, okay? I didn't introduce a set of devices yet. Then if I failed, I will introduce dressing devices like dressing stick or button hooker, okay? If I failed, I will do uh, simplification or changing or asking for help from others. So compensation is uh, uh, introducing a new way or adapting a device or assisted device or getting help. This is compensatory. So I always start with remediation and then go to compensation. Now you can do whatever you want. You can do CIMT, NDT, BNA. A task-oriented approach is an umbrella. Can, 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 hold, can work with anything else, okay? So if I found pain, I might uh, do contract relax from PNF to increase the range of motion, for example. So nothing prevents you, but you don't want to go uh, to the full approach to the PNF fully or entity. Now, remember this, there's no perfect approach. I told you before, what works with uh, uh, patient A not necessarily works with patient B, okay? So I don't recommend saying about yourself, I'm sensory integrative therapist, I'm NDT therapist. I am occupational therapist. I do screen for challenge in real life activities, work, leisure, and self-care. And then find the problems and decide to go remediation or compensation. This is OT. Now, whatever techniques like uh, Kinsey Tape or whatever is being marketed uh, today, it's okay, it's good. But remember your identity, that you are occupational therapist. And there are more details. I already uh, talked. Now, I will uh, speak uh, severe patients versus our oh, patients with severe stroke. Sorry, don't label your uh, clients. Patients with, uh, with severe stroke versus patients with uh, less uh, severe stroke. Now remember, in Fugelmeyer, if the score of upper move of Fugelmeyer is less than 24, this is severe. If the score 24 to 20, uh, 44, this is moderate. If it's uh, higher than 44 out of 66, this is uh, uh, mild. Um, simply, if the patient can open and close his hand, it's a moderate stroke. If the patient can do uh, tip pinch grasp, okay, and coordinate it, this is mild. If the patient cannot open and close his hand, this is severe, okay? So severe versus, versus uh, uh, mild stroke or less severe. In severe, you start, you, uh, block practice is, uh, practice is preferred. When the patient improves, you go to random practice. In severe practicing, one task is recommended. In, in, in uh, less severe, you vary the task order and the tools. Uh, manipulating the task and the compound, using different steps. So whenever the patient is less severe, you do this. Now feedback of results is better than feedback of, uh, uh, where's the feedback here? Uh, of, of knowledge of performance is preferred for severe, while knowledge of results is preferred for uh, less severe. So you start with the severe cases with knowledge of performance, meaning you correct or improve or help as he or she is doing the activity. While knowledge of results is at the end of the activity. Okay, uh, continuous feedback and f frequent feedback is for severe. Okay, while intermittent يعني متقطع, feedback is for, uh, for, uh, for less severe. Okay, for mild. Decreasing the amount, a lot of feedback and verbal guidance for severe and less amount uh, for, for less severe. Your feedback or correction, manual or verbal, should be faded back, yeah, meaning you should start with a lot and you go less. Everything, you start with blocked and go to random. You start with uh, continuous feedback and then you go to intermittent, okay? So feedback is your manual guidance or verbal correction Okay, uh, back to the complicated slide. This is available in my thesis with the guidelines I told you about. Start with writing SMART goals, and these should be uh, functional, fu uh, intensive, client-centered, and the levels of the goals should be pre-stroke quality, 
compromise, partially dependent on the affected and entire compensatory. I told you about this, and this is available. If you, I will uh, enable you with the name of my thesis. If you type my name and the th Pascal unit, you will find it. It's available in Minnesota University in library, free for everybody. So measurable, criterion-based, everything we talked about it. Then the treat, which should be client-centered, COBM, uh, functional, variable practice, you need life is changeable, variable, 70% uh, on the activities as end or goal, 30%, everything is here at the clinic and then home. Now this is a very challenging uh, uh, thing. This is a clinical reasoning um, uh, process. If the stroke, is not too chronic, less than five years. If the stroke is not too severe, if the patient, meaning the patient can grasp and release, like moderate or mild, if the client can do parts of the activity, like 40% of that activity, I recommend to go to uh, remediation, okay? Remediation, reversing. If these are not, available or a lot of them like the stroke is chronic the stroke is severe the client cannot do anything or like negligible parts of the activity i recommend to go compensation and here i listed a lot of compensatory studies i will uh, read some to define the task using assistive technology uh, adapting the environment uh, adding assistive device, reduce the effects of the gravity. For example, if uh, he is eating, uh, uh, ask him to put his elbow on the table and bend uh, the trunk or use mobile arm support. Uh, so tabletop activities for writing, ask him to do the activity tabletop with the gravity eliminated without elevation bar. Now I, I introduce a very important uh, term, degrees of freedom. If, uh, my patient has outreach Tremor, you know the tremor, outreach tremor, and uh, intentional tremor, and uh, rested tremor, Korea tremor, different types of tremor or rajya. Uh, so, if my patient has tremor and weakness in inefficiency, etc., if he is using all of his arm joints, the elbow, the shoulder, etc., I might ask him to adduct and uh, his shoulder, putting and put the elbow uh, at um, at sides. It's like the position of testing pronation subination. Okay, this is easier for writing and eating, etc. Um, I decrease the degrees of freedom. To do more challenge, I will do remediation. I will ask him to do, do all of his um, uh, joints. Now, so the criteria, chronicity, too, uh, too, uh, like long chronicity, too chronic, too severe, uh, less than 20% of the activity go to compensation. Now, the opposite of compensation, instead of having tabletop, I will go against gravity. Instead of having two joints, degrees, uh, degrees of freedom is uh, little, I will increase degrees of freedom, okay? Uh, strength, strengthening range of motion, a lot of examples, depending on the activity is available in this table. Um, so uh, I think most of you are, are, are um, uh, therapists. So uh, there are a lot of evidence related to task-oriented approach. This is one study uh, by you, Mark, in 1215, uh, tested the occupational therapy or the task-oriented therapy for four weeks. They have uh, improvement on power grip, lateral pinch, etc. box and blocks. I, these are the measurements. They improve the hand functions and daily activities as uh, documented by these activities. And then another study, two groups, task-oriented versus traditional. Uh, they tested for lower extremity, I told you, OT and BT works upper and lower. And uh, their, the task-oriented improvement was better, uh, improvements were better than for balance and ADL than the traditional treatment. Another uh, thing, they compared the task-oriented with repetitive bilateral training. Uh, both groups improved similarly. So. There is research evidence. Evidence-based practice is important, and I believe a lot of your clinical setting ask you to do a lot of presentation and evidence-based. Now, the most important, impressive, uh, et cetera, my baby, the, my thesis thing, well, uh, I published it uh, in 2016, but I did it in, I ended it in 2011. I was a little bit uh, lazy. Uh, it's uh, about the first clinical trial that now, uh, uh, there's two things. I will stop here, I will stop here. Uh, there are two things, the task-oriented 
uh, occupational therapy treatment and the task ori uh, oriented treatment. Task oriented is something generic for rehabilitation. For example, for gait, there are task oriented gait training. But when I say occupational therapy task oriented, this is the approach that I customize. Anyways, the study yielded in very important uh, changes in COPM. Uh, in wolf motor activity uh, and mal, a lot of improvements, significant improvements in function. Okay, and see, these are the uh, group that took the treatment initially in COPM, uh, and then they uh, they stopped treatment and maintained. This is the control; they didn't take anything, and then oh, they reached here. So the thing is, the beautiful thing that the patient improves and maintained. The each interval is six weeks, and. A lot of improvement, significant improvement. I will skip these two to go to uh, the uh, clinical case, but uh, impressive improvements in the timing of the, like how fast they are, how functional. COPM and Wolf Motor Activity Test. Here they are almost seven, uh, eight, eight seconds better than the control. Okay, patients said that the treatment in the study unique, homework uh, is uh, challenging, customized, interesting, Challenging. I uh, this is better than what I experienced. I would pay full money for this. Mine was free, and uh, I will refer someone else. Okay, so I'll stop here. Hamad. Hamad. Yes, I'm. I'm with you. Okay, so. Uh, and we are doing about time. We have thirty minutes, right? We have thirty minutes. Yes. Okay, um, I have the case study left uh, only. Okay, so if we say, um, let, let's start with this question. So um, we started occupational therapy with, with the promise that doing things is really good for your health. And occupational therapy is about doing occupations. And there is a term, occupation-based treatment. Um, so what's the difference between occupation-based treatment and being an authentic occupational therapist? with task oriented approach so what's what's so is it so what's task oriented approach task oriented approach is a, a sequence of the treatment or a way of treatment or but it's but a, as occupational therapists we all do occupations yes but you don't have a framework to do uh, to custom uh, to assess and intervene i gave you guidelines for when uh, what to do in terms of assessment, specific assessments, uh, flow chart for assessment, and then guideline when to go to compensation and remediation. We know all of these things by uh, general knowledge, but it's not specific. It's like uh, going uh, to the gym alone or going to the gym with a coach. So you are, it's more specific, more concrete. Uh, okay. Now the difference between uh, different terms, you might find different names for the approach, but the thing is, being OT, being consistent with feedback, like uh, no one talks about feedback, uh, the amount, exact amount of feedback, or the amount of the practice at home, etc. specifically, except the OT task-oriented approach. Now, you might find different names for the same concept. The beautiful thing is in this approach, Muhammad, is it's consistent, with, it's, it seems like it's OT, okay? But it's concrete, specific. Uh, and you might find a lot of uh, alternatives for names. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Yazid from Palestine, uh, do you have suggestions, special suggestion, in order to match this model to different cultures? Yeah, so uh, I, I could, the, the, my study was conducted in the States and I'm, diff, I'm, I'm a foreigner, right? Okay. So I was able to do it. Uh, so you need what is forbidden or not, haram, halal, uh, right, left hand, uh, scarf, uh, hijab, etc. You need to consider the consideration of the uh, uh, society when you do the treatment. So it fits all, all contexts and, and environments, I think. Okay, um, Noura, uh, can you please repeat the difference? But, but before, before Muhammad, I want to, do, to tell you something. Uh, uh, this approach, uh, in an explicit way, uh, say that go and use whatever techniques, or whatever techniques when you find critical control parameter, for example, spasticity. You know that entity is good for spasticity. Or for example, Biomechanical approach is good uh, for uh, range of motion. So it's it's like the orchestra uh, leader for other approaches, in my okay. opinion. Okay, perfect. Uh, Noura says, um, can you please repeat the difference? 
I don't know, the difference in the ABC treatment? Uh, oh, okay, okay, I got it. So uh, these are the terms that, uh, that like the, uh, the flow charts or the brain uh, charts that I draw in my uh, pro refined protocol. So you need to do the clinical reasoning and in, 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 uh, process in assessment and treatment and hit for uh, goals that are smart and realistic. The goals can be at level A, I'm talking about long-term goals. Level B or C. Level A is I'm retaining the patient to the same amount of performance prior to stroke. This is for gross uh, task or uh, if the patient is so mild. Like the patient might have uh, a goal like driving and he can drive in the same way, uh, while typing cannot be in the same way prior to stroke. So driving should be level A. Uh, typing might have some compensation, but he still uses his affected hand. So this is level B goal. And if he is totally driving or typing with his right hand, not, not the affected one hand, this is level C, totally dependent on the non-affected or assisted device. The same thing is for treatment. I told you that 70% of the time should be on goals, the outcomes of COPR. Right. So if the treatment is on goals, this is level A, the elite thing we want to spend time on. If it's on something meaningful, but it's not goal, from leisure or self-care, this is level B. If it's something uh, therapeutic and root and, uh, and rigid, does not have any like uh, uh, cons, arc, etc., this is level C, and I don't recommend uh, level C. Okay, so what are the, I, this is a big question, what are the theories that uh, can be used, uh, or what's your evidence to support auto? Okay, I, I cited four studies for you. And there are tons of studies. This is the evidence for the approach and it's improving. And uh, for the scientific rationale, uh, I told you it's uh, based on system models. This is a very old classic uh, theory, system models. Uh, 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 systems model, sorry, systems model, which means heterarchical organization of functional performance. And it's based on motor learning and motor control and pure OT theories, the occupational science. Okay, next. Okay, uh, in the previous slide, uh, which is talking about hand treating using catch and release exercises, how, how did you start immediately treating hand without walk working in shoulder or elbow first? Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. Because uh, the, uh, the thing, if uh, I teach six different approaches, depending on the approach, if you are teaching, working under NDT, there are certain fixed uh, things. Don't strengthen, this is NDT. Treat spasticity, this is NDT. Work proximal to distance, phallocodal, this is NDT because it's neurodevelopmental. While task-oriented approach says, treat critical control parameter. For me, why the patient would reach in the first place if his hand is not working? What, uh, do you reach for nothing except for stretching? Okay, so I thought that I need to the thing that prevent reaching and everything, the critical control parameter is the spastic hand. The spasticity is dealt with in a task oriented approach in two things. I told you the ultimate controller of tone is the hand. So the first step is stretching. You do a lot of stretching with your patient and you teach him self stretching technique like uh, on a table or like this. I will show you pictures. So stretching decreases tone temporarily. Prolonged stretch is a well-known NDT or I think uh, NF technique to reduce spasticity. This time, you buy time in order to, to do uh, plasticity-dependent exercises. So when you relax the tone, you immediately ask the patient to, uh, to use or engage in activity. This engagement mimics what happens with kids. It's reorganizing the brain. So uh, a task-oriented approach is a different, independent theory. It's not pure OT, because OTs are not usually uh, fluent with this terminology, but we want to uh, have them fluent, okay? So, so you stretch to buy time, and then you train to uh, train, uh, train or uh, do the exercise, the grasp release, in order to organize the cortex. Actually, what is the representation of the elbow in comparison with the, with the hand on the cortex? It's negligible. So the, the damage is mainly on the, in, the, in the hand. So this is a different theory, okay? Next. Muhammad. Muhammad. 
Uh, Sherman is asking about task-oriented approach with double task. Can this be used in real situation? Uh, what are your suggestions to improve abilities in double tasks? Tasks. Dual task, you mean? Yes. Yeah, I told you that you need to be natural, right? So usually, uh, dual task, like it, it deals with, with cognition, dual attention, sustained attention, etc. Now, if the patient activity requirement includes dual task, you do it dual task. Otherwise, so, so be like, make life easy on yourself. You find the activities of the patient, if or the goals by COPM. If the goals indicated or me there's a need for dual tasking, you will do dual tasking. Simply, it's uh, enabling patient with with time, supported time with support, and you give him remedial or compensatory strategies to find the optimal way of doing the activity, which might be dual. Okay, uh, we are looking for efficient and effective. I believe, or the approach believe, that there is nothing you cannot learn. Every, every, I can learn Korean, for, that, for example, at this point, or piano, right? Without any need. What if I cannot eat? I will find way to, to learn if I got enough support by compensation and remediation. Now, if the task is dual, you do dual training. Um, okay, we have to, uh, okay. So, uh, what's the length of the intervention length? Uh, with the clients with strokes, so either high or low functioning using the auto. What about, uh, what about, uh, let me uh, demonstrating my uh, case study, and okay. that might be uh, anything else about, uh, other than the treatment? Uh, there is one last question about. Uh, I will, uh, because we have 20 minutes, let me, uh, let me uh, go to my case study, and then we will uh, get back to the questions, okay? Please. Now, this is Mr. J, um, one of my favorite clients. Uh, he kindly agreed to, uh, to use his photo, videos, uh, but I respect him, so I put this. Uh, this is Mr. J doing activity as end, which is buttoning, and this is Wii. Uh, I recommend using the Wii. It's a cheap version of real, of virtual reality. Anyways, he was a 60 years old, a 12 years hemoparietic patient, uh, and he has some uh, vascular accident, uh, left hemiparesis, uh, uh, left hemiplegia, uh, slight carpal um, uh, tunnel syndrome, a lot of other problems. But look at this uh, fracture, no pain. Uh, he has the Fugelmeyer is 23 out of 66, which means severe stroke. His motor activity log scores is 0.26 out of 5. 0.21 motor activity log is about the amount of use and the how well quality use. Like uh, how often and how well does the patient use his affected arm in real life activity, the dirty task that I talk about. So this means that he has learned manures. Anything less than 2.5 is learned manures. So he's severe and learned manures. So my, this is the objective, the assessment. Uh, he is a severe chronic stroke uh, accompanied with significant learned manures. So after I conducted the assessment as I, uh, the role checklist, the interest checklist, the COPM, the activity analysis, I found the critical control parameters included uh, uh, spasticity, weakness, etc. I identified five problematic areas as control parameters. I, uh, they are listed in my thesis if you are interested, but they included uh, spasticity, weakness, pain, it's, uh, not pain, tremor, I think. So uh, the goals uh, should be smart. I will not go about the structure of the goal, but the body of the goal. Washing his right upper extremity because his left is affected. He cannot re uh, reach to the right. Uh, playing and shuffling cards, peeling a chub onion, drive a screw because he wants um, in a piece of wood because he wants uh, home maintenance. Now he told me cooking. Cooking is not specific, but I kept investigating to know that peeling and chopping is the difficult thing, especially for onion. Playing cards was challenging, especially with shuffling. Uh, uh, home maintenance was difficult, specifically with screw driving. And dressing was difficult, specifically for shirt, uh, shirt uh, buttoning shirt. So the full goal, I will uh, read one goal. By the end of six, uh, treatment pro um, week treatment, Mr. J will independently button his shirt. Okay, this is not specific yet or major, but using his right hand and his left hand to assist or support in less than two minutes. So I have two minutes 
standing, etc. So this is, these are full goals related to the patient. Remember, washing or bathing, playing cards, peel and chop. These are what are uh, the most, the top five for this patient, okay? Now, you do activities as end and activities as mean. I will go walk you through examples. Here is very important task oriented. So what I do, I prepare for the function, like you do preparation. How NDT fix the posture and, and decrease the tone? We prepare by stretching. This is therapist stretching. This is self stretching using the other hand and this is weight bearing stretching. Okay, so stretch and stretch and stretch, stretching like more than 20 minutes will relax uh, the muscles, okay? So that you buy time for functional training. Then these activities as, as mean. I don't spend a lot of time on this. He likes uh, basketball, but I don't bas have basketball. See here, I'm, I'm uh, trying to de-associate movement, increase reaching, uh, increase spontaneous use of the hand. This is a very important goal for treatment. You want the use to be spontaneous. And this, he liked tennis, okay? So I did compromise. So if he, if the tennis was his goal or the basket, this is wrong. Because I need to do the exact natural context. So there, I did this, I, I changed the ball. With the, here is a four ball, which enabled me to do more uh, customized treatment. It's easier for me to treat with a foam ball. So activities, to increase strength, range of motion, spontaneous use, to decrease. So, spasticity and motor control are encouraged in two steps, stretching and then uh, engagement in meaningful activities that are either uh, uh, activities as in, uh, as mean, like this here, he likes the Wii, but it's not a goal for him. Wii is very cheap and uh, meaningful uh, activity, it's fun certain uh, games like here is chopping they, they throw like um, a big piece of bread uh, pop can etc and the task is to chop it each time sometimes from horizon sometimes from vertical it's variable fun uh, and it's nice for bilateral and unilateral training it's very beautiful and the Wii also has a Wii Fit Plus which is like a board uh, for balance and weight shifting so I like it and I saw that it's effective the other thing is also treatment as mean uh, included. He likes uh, going to the gym, so I created a task. Uh, just take the weight from here to here. Uh, grass and release tasks, this is are important. Yeah, this, this is level C, like it's not meaningful. But this is level B, he likes uh, weights. This is level C, okay? While these are level B, because he likes these activities. These are from his leisure or uh, functional activity that are not, like uh, eating might be level B. If it's not a goal, it could be level B because it's important for everybody. So these are level C. The first slide is level B, which are meaningful activities, but they are not goals. These are not meaningful activities, like cause, grass release, but I, and except for this one, this is level uh, level V because he likes uh, weights. Now going to activity as in uh, chopping, I started to chop an onion with him, but because of the smell, we shifted and to vary the context, we shifted uh, to do different things. See, uh, here he he couldn't open his hand. Now he is uh, chopping, uh, but. Usually the left hand rule in, in cutting is just stability, right? But I did some adaptation. This is compromised level because I bought non-skid mat down uh, and the left hand did not participate that much. Here, uh, it's also uh, activity. This, uh, as, as, as uh, end, he was chopping and according to their culture, the guy who asked about Palestine thing, uh, American does not uh, or do not like to waste food. So because of this culture, I converted the, our uh, designed the, the, the treatment by asking him to eat the, the, the cucumber or the apple that he chopped. So these are, this is for chopping onion. Uh, and at home, I told him to do chopping one onion a day. Okay, now this is the exercise for bathing, uh, simulation. You do simulation, I cannot go, uh, do real bathing with him. So we simulate the thing. Now the whole practice is better than the part practice. 
you know the part practice uh, forward chaining and backward chaining these are for severe we uh, forward or backward chain but in the clinic since i cannot do uh, the real activity i simulate it okay uh, like muhaka at home he do the real uh, bathing with 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 his wife or uh, caregiver and then uh, with himself uh, i give him a lot of time like 20 minutes then uh, 15 minutes then 10 minutes etc and this is the th thing to do work in life is dressing i don't know who invented the dressing frames i think they are for for assessment but what what on earth does it mean to, to do a button on the dressing frame while you can ask the patient to bring his um, shirt it's easy simple simplicity is the ultimate complexity and see uh, you, you, a little tip for you start with goals that you can achieve so that you can improve the therapeutic robot and then go more deep to the challenging if you go to the a challenging uh, tasks like this one this one is okay you can start with it you go to this one buttoning is very difficult without improving spasticity and the grip uh, the patient um, will get demo uh, demotivated and depressed and you might lose him this is a card playing it's easy you play any simple game you ask your patient to shuffle and play at home and the clinic but you need to do the 30 percent homework like the strengthening the specific thing here this is the goal driving a screw i started like this uh, uh, I started supporting the uh, the piece of wood, and then he started to support it. And then we, I moved to the point that I was challenging him. I was moving as he was uh, driving. This is the wrench, and he's doing some manual work. This is interesting. This is like a sandpaper, uh, but it's a machine for 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 sanding. We did it. He brought. Uh, he bought the paper. The, he, uh, made the clinic uh, so dirty. So I adopted the exercise and told them, okay, now self, uh, home maintenance exercise, clean your 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 uh, your mess, okay? Then I said that, okay, at home do it, but here we will not uh, put the paper so that I don't uh, make a lot of mess. All of these uh, tasks should be graded and coupled with home-based exercises. In my thesis, there's a table for uh, all of his exercises, including home-based and uh, uh, exercise and clinical exercise. So please, therapists, think about four, uh, uh, four, four squares. Divide your brain into clinic and home. Design activities as end and as, uh, as uh, uh, mean. So you end up with four categories of exercises. Activities as end in the clinic. Activity as mean in the clinic. Then activity as end at home, activity as end as, as mean at home. So two uh, uh, types of activity at home and two types at clinic, mean and end. 70% of the time should be spent on the type uh, as end. Now look at the beautiful changes. He was 0.26 out of five, and these were conducted by independent uh, uh, blinded evaluator, he jumped within six weeks to two, th uh, three, like uh, 10 times improved. Uh, he didn't reach the out of landing use, but he was going there. Uh, so you need to, to, to have like a, a lot of stamina. Reversing uh, like uh, 60 years of practicing or 55 years of practicing in six weeks is not easy. And this, uh, the how well scale improved, like COPM performance jumped from three to five, four. So two points change in COPM is meaningful and clinically important in research. The same thing for satisfaction. And his uh, uh, spasticity and all buttons improved. So the client received six weeks of one hour and a half, two times a week, which means hours of treatment and achieved all what he's achieved. He said that this is a client-centered, interesting, challenging, effective, better than uh, treatment that I ever received. My emphasis was for him, uh, keep doing the stuff you are doing, the exercises you will be improving. Now, what we do in approach is we don't give the patient a fish, we learn him how to fish. So I, tell, uh, I, I taught him how we teach them how to fish. I taught him how to analyze the activity and gradually it, uh, remove the critical control parameter. So limitation, it's difficult, it needs thinking. We don't always have the temper 
in the clinic to think and customize treatment. We like to put the patient on drugs, etc. Okay. Uh, when we graduate, we have the spirit and the, the energy, but gradually there's a burnout and uh, things happens with us. So it's hard to customize. It's easier to, to run a restaurant with one sandwich over buffet or different uh, dishes, okay? There's more delicious, right? Uh, instead of stucking in one type of exercise. So don't ever, because do the same treatment for every patient. And sometimes patients come to you and say, heal me, without doing their work. If they didn't do all, they will not improve. And believe me, when I did my study, I reviewed possible techniques at the time. I didn't choose task-oriented approach because I'm OT, because I believed in vector stimulation, CIMT. For example, CIMT takes the league, elite of the patient. Uh, you should be able to move your hand, etc. Now the uh, readings, my thesis, my and uh, chapter uh, uh, six, I think in uh, seven, which is talking about motor uh, uh, assessing uh, motor ability and capacities. This is about uh, evaluating uh, apraxia, uh, evaluating uh, tone, etc. So to uh, sum up, hit productivity. Uh, uh, self-care, client-centered partnership, IRKL, the brain is important, but it's not the only thing. Stretching, uh, uh, stretch, and then actively engage in use. The uh, functional base, feedback, intensity, compensation and uh, remediation, home clinic treatment, home or clinic, activity as end versus activity as uh, mean, activity as end, 70%, activity as mean is 30%, and you can use NDD, PNF, etc. Be flexible and change your treatment dynamically if the patient wants or his performance changed. Um, and these are the references. يا غلام احفظ الله يحفظك اقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله للجميع. شكرا لحسن استماعكم الان راح نفتح المجال للاسئله. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of Just CRS, we would like to thank Dr. Khadr for this engaging presentation and webinar. Uh, this is very powerful, thank you so much. Um, let me go through uh, some of the announcements uh, before we go to the questions. Uh, there is a quiz at the end, it will be posted in the same uh, section in the uh, uh, course, in the, in the webinar area. Uh, so, um, uh, if you get 70% of, uh, of the questions right, uh, a very easy qu uh, quiz, you'll be eligible for a certificate from our program. Our program is just CRS. Um, if you need to change your name uh, from Robin Hood to your real name, please do so uh, by uh, you know, going to the profile tab uh, at the uh, at, uh, Maharat platform. Um, also, um, uh, please come back to this uh, platform again. Uh, we are doing uh, other webinars tomorrow and uh, after tomorrow. Um, and we will uh, give you access to all these uh, uh, webinars. Uh, also, we have uh, many uh, electronic courses that will be posted and again, I invite you to attend the uh, electronic course about task-oriented approach by Dr. Uh, Khadr al-Mehdawi. Again, it will be coming uh, in the coming days uh, and using and through this platform. All this work is, um, is uh, courtesy, uh, is brought to you courtesy of Just CRS, which is uh, a program and uh, a project uh, um, with a generous fund uh, from the EU. Thank you, Erasmus Plus, for this. And also, uh, this webinar is brought to you courtesy by uh, just Jordan University of Science and Technology and the Electronic uh, and the E-Learning Center uh, and the uh, free and new Maharat uh, uh, platform. Uh, Maharat platform is um, a free uh, platform uh, given uh, by uh, Jordan University of Science and Technology and offers uh, courses to everyone. So please share with others this platform. Um, and thank you Ahmed, so much. I, uh, I want to add something. I and my Twitter handle. This is my email. Adjust.edu uh, if you want to uh, 
uh, ask anything later because of the time due to Joe. And my uh, my Twitter handle is at at Kader Joe. If you wanna ask anything, I'll be more than um, happy to help. Any 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 quick question, Muhammad? Before we end, Muhammad. Sorry, sorry. What's your take on neuroplasticity and uh, how, as OTs, we can we can yeah. put this in mind? Uh, I give a lecture for my students. If you are interested in uh, neuroplasticity, talk with me. But there is ten principles, uh, practical principles for plast neuroplasticity. The most important are use it or lose it. Use it to improve it. Silence. So as the much uh, affected uh, arm the more you reverse the uh, maladaptive neuroplastic changes. The neuroplastic changes is the ability of the brain to change to better performance or poor performance. So for example, poor uh, or maladaptive neuroplasticity is like seizure or uh, 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 epilepsy or, or dystonia, okay? Uh, so these changes, but we want good changes like increase the area of the brain to improve their performance. Uh, uh, an imp, or make it more responsive. So use it to improve it. Uh, the more you use, the more the 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 excited the threshold gets lower, but more excited. The the uh, ex excitable. I mean, more responsive. Like the patient, uh, the 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 patient arm is not responsive. It's slow, clumsy because the threshold of activation is is very high. You need to do neuroblastic uh, uh, experience dependent training. Use it to improve it, to decrease the threshold. Also, use it to improve it, like the, uh, the representation of uh, the pianist, uh, the one who play piano, fingers is different than yours. The representation uh, of the fingers, uh, the, 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 the person is different than yours, etc. So, plasticity follows experience. Now, silence. The change of neuroplasticity in terms of size and location and excitability uh, is maximum if the activity is meaningful. More, more questions? Okay, so um, what's the VR device that you used with your patient? Uh, it, it, what's it's the not name? a VR device. I, I like to do, uh, not cheap, affordable uh, tricks. So I found uh, the Nintendo Wii. You can okay. customize the games. I found the game, it's in the Wii Fit Plus, I think it's like chubbing. They throw something and you chub it. Uh, the criteria for using we is finding a game that you can be the opponent of the patient and it's not time dependent. Meaning it's not suitable because if you served, the patient needs to respond. While chubbing, you can stop and wait till uh, give him more time and then challenge him gradually. So it's called we, we like W-I-I. And uh, there is a lot of articles we have now, they, they call it, or we rehab. Okay? Okay. okay. It has also a board that is good for balance. Very interesting uh, games. I recommend clinicians uh, uh, to have it. It's cheap, but the virtual reality, uh, expensive and complicated ones. Okay, the task-oriented approach was used uh, mainly with stroke. Have it been used with uh, TPI, CP? Okay, one of uh, Dr. Jeff here, remember uh, Dr. Bernadette? She offered or asked me several times to, uh, to, to conduct a study with but I didn't have time and I, I was immature at that time. Okay. Uh, so it can be used with mental health. Muhammad, Muhammad, you find a problem and you go compensatory or remedial simply. But now because kids are not energetic like adults, you need to uh, negotiate with their mother. Okay. So uh, these are mainly the questions that we had uh, from the audience. Um, Again, uh, if you need uh, any question, you can email me or email uh, Dr. Khadr directly. Uh, please go through the website of our program, the, which is the Just CRS uh, website. Uh, okay, okay, Muhammad, Muhammad, I want, uh, if Jeff want to talk, Jeff did, conducted a very nice study uh, on using orthotics combined with, with task-oriented. I don't know, do you want to do, add anything, Jeff? Or say hi, at least? Unmute, okay, go ahead, Jeff. Um, hi everyone. Um, I uh, I'm really honored to be here because um, Carter he is one of my mentor. Um, I learned uh, auto approach from him and both, you know, of course, from uh, Dr. Matthew Woods. 
Um, I designed a splint for people uh, post-stroke and I, I use it for my doctoral dissertation as well. I wanna add that um, I did have a case who is not at all motivated and it was quite challenging because, well, uh, by default, my study was, well, I only look at um, joint range of motion and muscle strength because, you know, that's what the splint for. So I didn't realize that it's really the psychological factor that kind of be the a critical control parameter. And I find it, I found it like three weeks after, and then I changed my intervention. Uh, I use his wife because his wife is considered as the environment of him. So I, I use his wife um, and his family to help. And I only have three weeks and he ended up uh, improved significantly by showing me that he reclaimed his driver's license from the state department and he is driving using his hand. So it's really how, I how we determine the parameter and then we find a way to really address that factor. That would be really hard and really interesting. So, so uh, Jeff brought the uh, idea or emphasized the mental uh, aspects and the th psychosocial. I remember a harsh uh, discussion between me and my, when I was uh, stubborn and uh, less mature, when I did my master's, my mentor, and uh, our group research, we were discussing about uh, the importance of motivation. And I was personal about that. And no, there's no importance for their motivation. The important thing is to change the performance at that time. But now, uh, without motivation, like think about your life in the, in the quarter uh, time now, and you cannot go out, you are demotivating, you are not doing the things that you are. Uh, I want to tell you this, uh, and this is the promising, and uh, this is the last thing that uh, I'll tell. For now, uh, imagine that your uh, uh, joints have a screw, like the range of motion is limited. And you are, uh, there's like uh, 20 kilograms of weight bounded on your hand, like a weight cuffs. And each time you want to move your affected arm, your arm is painful and not responsive. And it's like there's an interval between do, do reaching and the actual reaching between the order. It's, it's depressing, it's stressing. Okay, so motivation, a lot of motivation is needed here. Thank you, Dr. Jeff, for this. Dr. Muhammad, I'm done here, unless there's something I can add. Uh, thank you so much. Um, again, uh, we, will, we will look into uh, providing everybody with, with, the, with the presentation and also the uh, recorded webinar. Uh, it will be posted on this um, uh, course, uh, on this platform. So thank you so much. And again and again and again, uh, please enroll in the electronic uh, MOOC, electronic course uh, given also by Dr. Khadr Al-Mahdawi at this platform. So uh, please sign up for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Khadr. Thank you, everybody. And I hope to uh, hear from you and communicate, help, cooperate with you. It was uh, honor, uh, a big honor for me to have this much of uh, uh, excellent uh, impressive threats from the whole world. Thank you, and uh, uh, I'm sorry if I did not uh, meet any of your uh, previous expectations or I was talking uh, so fast. Thank you, and have a great night. And be safe with your all, uh, beloved one. And please, please make whatever necessary to balance between your leisure, self-care, and productivity activity these hard times uh, that we are trapped at home. Be safe and uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salam. Bye. Salam